Hi, I'm John Cedar. I'm chair of the Kidney X Steering Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome you for joining our second Innovate Kidney webinar series to help entrepreneurs pursuing innovations for people with kidney diseases. The steering committee has identified three organizations, each with different expertise, and each, each of them um, are sharing their advice during this series. We had our first session last week, and today we have our uh, second session. The finals webinar will be next week, Monday, June 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. To learn more about our webinar series or KidneyX, please uh, visit our website at kidneyx.org. We hope that you, and we're sure that you're gonna learn from today's discussion, hosted by Sheila Hedye and Balaj Belshuti of Health Advances. We encourage you to send questions in the chat during the presentation and feel free to reach out uh, to them after the seminar is over. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's edition of Kidney X webinar series. My name is Balaj Felchuti. I'm a partner at Health Advances uh, and co-lead uh, of our renal practice. I will be conducting today's webinar with Sheila Hegde, uh, another partner and co-lead of uh, the renal practice at Health Advances. Our objective today is to discuss advances in kidney medicine. So after a brief introduction of health advances, we'll be talking about uh, the market landscape in artificial kidney and xenotransplantation, discussing the market trends, uh, as well as how we can support uh, the development and commercialization of uh, innovating technologies and products. That will be followed by a, a Q&A session. Here you see bios of the team that developed this material. Uh, we have a dedicated renal practice. Um, they are all members of, uh, of that practice, uh, and I thank them for their contribution. So a brief introduction to Health Advances. Uh, health Advances is a um, healthcare-focused um, strategy consulting firm. We've been around for 30 years, and we covered the full spectrum of uh, product development and uh, corporate strategy. Uh, we are innovative, innovation focused and uh, data driven uh, and focused on um, actionable impact and, uh, and recommendations. One of our unique differentiators is our broad sector coverage. Um, not only do we have a biopharma practice, but we also have dedicated practices for medical devices diagnostics, life sciences research tools, uh, digital health, health IT, and healthcare services. This allows us to understand the interconnectedness uh, of these technologies and products, which in turn helps us um, develop uh, actionable recommendations that um, apply to all of these. Uh, we, we worked across the, the spectrum of uh, innovative products um, in, the, in, the, in the kidney care space, including dialysis, kidney transplantation, various therapeutics, uh, wearables and implantables. We've completed over 200 Reno projects uh, in, uh, in our practice. Uh, one of our ways that we differentiate ourselves is our proprietary expert database. 
Uh, we have over 45,000 experts uh, in, our, uh, in our database covering the various stakeholders that uh, are usually um, required to be, to be consulted for um, development and commercialization uh, issues, including payers, prescribers, um, uh, technical experts, and regulatory experts. And now I'll hand it uh, over to Sheila, and she'll talk about the market landscape in the xenotransplantation and artificial kidney. Great. Thanks, Blaj. So looking at this market, we always, you know, step back and look at the underlying patient population. Um, we all probably here probably know, you know, there are about 500,000 patients annually who are receiving dialysis. Uh, 500, and that's growing to 550, 600,000, and then about 200 to 250,000 that receive transplants each year. Uh, and we see these uh, patient segments growing about three to four percent annually, uh, driven by rising comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, the aging population. But at the same time, uh, some of the innovations we see in the landscape are are, are helping and helping to curb uh, some of that growth, including improved uh, chronic kidney disease management. We're seeing earlier diagnosis and improved therapies, which will in turn improve the prognosis towards end stage renal disease and more transplants. Uh, we, we're also seeing that transplant market growing slightly ahead of the dialysis market uh, and seeing more al transplants performed in the U.S. across this time. Uh, so that's the underlying patient population. And just looking at the journey and the patient experience, we really do see a landscape ripe for innovation. Uh, when we think about dialysis, we all know the burden of, of dialysis. The long sessions that patients have to endure multiple times per week and a lot of the side effects of sequelae that really impair patient quality of life. On the transplant side, uh, we all know about the organ shortages, long wait lists, many people don't even receive a transplanted organ. Those that do have to endure nephrotoxic immunosuppressant regimens, long-term use of corticosteroids, which have very unfavorable side effects, and risk of complication with the organ or rejection, which requires continuous and frequent follow-up. So there are many, many issues on both the dialysis and transplant side that innovations can address. One of them, just diving into the transplant, um, as we're talking about xenotransplantation and artificial kidney here, is that despite some of the trends um, that we've seen that have enabled more access to kidneys uh, and donor kidneys from expanded cadaver criteria to improved organ preservation technologies, there still are many patients on the wait list. You know, as of April this year, there were about 92,000 people that are on the wait list. Every year, about 40,000 people are added. And as you can see on the, on the graph here, um, there are almost 40% of people who are still on the wait list as of three years. And at that point, about 50% of people have been removed. So, you know, just the tremendous market potential here, about 30 to 50% of these patients on the wait list, where we can see some of these novel technologies, including xenotransplantation, artificial kidneys be able to address. So turning uh, you know, to the future and what we're very excited about you know, with, with the winners here and, and many of the ongoing innovations in the field is that what we're seeing really in this decade is hopefully a shift from conventional dialysis, um, you know, drugs to just help slow progression, organ transplants to many more options for patients in the future, including implantable kidneys, biohybrid, 3D printed, wearable or portable dialysis systems that can really improve the convenience and, and, and in particular the outcomes of dialysis, improved perfusion systems to even further improve our organ viability and finally xenotransplantation. So being able to really open up the supply and access to transplants through cells, organs, and tissues from animals to humans. This landscape uh, has yet to mature, but we are seeing many, uh, many organizations, companies, academic centers, all working hard to, to bring some of these innovations to reality. Uh, some of the least mature technologies are on the wearable dialysis and implantable kidney side, but we do see a lot of uh, organizations working here, including some of the Kidney X Prize winners. Xenotransplantation, we've seen some tremendous progress, which we'll talk about. Um, here in making this also uh, a reality within the next decade, potentially. Improved perfusion systems, as we mentioned before. But we're also seeing um, drugs, new drugs that are slowing CKD progression. We've seen new launches from 
uh, BMS and Bayer uh, in this space. So a really exciting innovation landscape. To those that are innovating, you know, there are challenges um, that will come along the way, um, but we have a lot of reason to believe. You know, just looking at the Zeta transplantation landscape in the last two years, we've seen some real groundbreaking milestones. We've seen companies like eGenesis raise tremendous capital to be able to have the investments needed to bring along these technologies from preclinical concept to clinical um, testing. We've seen some in clinic uh, amazing developments from successfully transplanting pig organs into deceased donors and, and then into brain dead donors, but where there was no rejection for up to three days. And then more, rec and then more recently, and this is actually on the heart side, but again, gives us a lot of hope uh, on the kidney side is the successful implantation of a pig heart into a patient who actually survived for two months. So we're making progress, um, small steps, but very, very important steps. As we work with companies, uh, we advise on a lot of these challenges that need to be overcome uh, across the development stages to bring some of these technologies to market. On the xenotransplantation side, there are technical challenges to be, um, to be addressed. Uh, companies trying to optimize the gene editing required to, to really minimize the risk of rejection um, and more learn as there's more clinical developments. On the clinical development side, patient recruitment is challenged. Um, there are you know, fears around this type of technology. Uh, there are onerous potential uh, supplemental therapies that will need to be taken, including immunosuppressive therapies in the first generations of these. And so clinical development, you know, it may be slow uh, in terms of patient recruitment and also may be long in order to demonstrate some of the survival benefits that would qualify some of these xenografts as viable bridging options in end stage renal disease. On the manufacturing side, we know already some of these companies are working to build supply chains, even just for clinical testing, uh, needing significant quality controls, needing to maintain some of the pig animal models in clean facilities of, of significant scale. On the regulatory side, FDA has yet to define uh, trial requirements as companies bring these technologies into clinic. XUS agencies also need significant education. And then once these technologies do reach the market, on the payer side, there will be need to prove the health economic benefits of using this approach versus conventional approaches. And there are going to be some public perception issues to manage um, around xenotransplantation. Turning to other technologies in the artificial kidney landscape, uh, again, a lot of very exciting developments on both the wearable portable dialysis side as well as the implantable technology side. FDA has been supportive and approved for use in human clinical trials. Uh, some of these technologies we know there's demand for more user-friendly and portable alternatives to coming into clinic. And it's always uh, important to see investments from the incumbents and market leaders like Medtronic and Fresenius who are investing in their own portable uh, artificial kidney systems. On the implantable side, there is possibility for enhanced functioning compared to some of the wearable systems where you could actually preserve some tubular renal functions uh, versus just uh, pure wearable device approaches. Um, and we are, again, seeing support from government agencies, such as FDA's Early Access Program, uh, supporting the development of implantable kidneys. These types of technologies also have challenges to address across the development stages. On uh, the technical side, um, really miniaturizing these devices and really being able to do that and still maintain the strong uh, metabolic functions that you need and that will be equivalent to traditional uh, dialysis approaches. Um, here too, on the clinical development side, there will be some, you know, potential slow recruiting uh, with some of the risks with these new technologies. On the manufacturing side, these are expensive devices. You know, uh, the implantables require hemocartridge bioreactors. Some of the dialysate regeneration systems on the wearable side, you're miniaturizing. These components can get very expensive, and so companies need to figure out how to manage those costs, uh, especially when they're not at scale. On the regulatory side, again, some encouraging signs from FDA with the fast track uh, designation for some of these technologies. So some support, some support from um, FDA on these devices. And then on the commercial side here, 
really ensuring strong usability and training, uh, especially on the wearable side. And these really do disrupt uh, the current system. So the reimbursement pathways will need to be rethought. Service ecosystems will need to be also engineered. So I highlighted a lot of those trends and I'll turn it back to my colleague Balaj to speak to how we can support companies at, the, at these um, exciting fields. Thank you, Sheila. So we're typically engaged Thanks. with early stage ventures in four ways uh, for different project types. Uh, early business strategy to uh, develop a viable business model and business strategy, which then sets the company up for uh, financing and we support uh, the development of, of pitch um, materials uh, and sales decks, integrated clinical development planning, um, and, and finding the right partner, partnership strategy. Early business strategy starts with identifying, prioritizing the right indication. Uh, what are we going after? What is our uh, target market? What are the um, trends and dynamics in that market? What is our right to win? How is our technology, our product going to fit in? Um, what analogs um, can we identify and learn from others that have um, already um, been in uh, uh, markets like that? And then finally, what is the right business model? And what's the commercial potential of the product culminating in a revenue forecast? The sales pitch and, uh, and, and sales materials for fundraising. Um, similarly, we start with uh, market assessment and uh, the right positioning for the product, which requires understanding the competition and comparing ourselves to the competition and how we're dif differentiated, how the product is going to be perceived by the market. And we typically conduct uh, robust prim primary research with the key stakeholders, payers, prescribers, regulatory agencies, uh, patient advocacies, even patients themselves as needed. And finally, what are the growth opportunities beyond uh, the lead indication or, or the lead program for the, the product or the technology? For uh, an integrated clinical development plan, we often reach out to our uh, parent company, Parexcel. Parexcel is a global CRO with unparalleled regulatory and clinical operations capabilities, which we then couple with our uh, commercial valuation, commercial assessment uh, capabilities and come up with uh, an integrated clinical development plan that optimizes uh, the product's development, both for uh, regulatory approval, but also robust market adoption after, um, after launch. And finally, identifying the right partner. Most early stage companies eventually partner uh, or uh, attract uh, additional investors. Uh, for partnership purposes, um, uh, a partnership can offer multiple benefits. Obviously, uh, uh, it's capital injection, but also uh, capabilities, um, whether it's in development, manufacturing, or commercialization. So we start with identifying the right partnership uh, evaluation criteria that, that's going to uh, lead to the uh, ideal partner. Uh, we narrow down uh, the field, uh, conduct uh, deep dives into a short list of companies uh, and make our recommendation based on uh, the best strategic fit and, uh, and vision for the company. And now we'll transition to Q&A and we would be glad to um, field your questions. Hi, everyone. It's Sheila Hegde, and I, I've seen some questions in the chat, and we've been trying to answer them live in the chat, but maybe we can take a few live. Sure, I can um, read out some questions. My name is Monica Shaw. I'm also a um, member of Health Advances with Sheila and Bola. She'll help, will help to facilitate the question and answer, help answer as well. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm going to start from the bottom. So, passion and artificial kidney. Developer, developer address the potential need for immunosuppressants. Should we focus on current immunosuppressant regimen? I would say, I, I think from a clinical strategy perspective, um, starting with, with current standard of care is probably the, you know, um, the most prudent 
path forward. We are, you know, we do a lot of work in the immunosuppressant space, and we also understand um, some of the changes that uh, companies are looking at with, uh, you know, with transplanted organs, with xeno organs. Uh, but some of those have not yet been validated, and typically in a regulatory path, you're looking at established standard of care. Um, but if there's a case where a, a regimen should be used or is safer, you can make that case with FDA. We have regulators um, in our company, ex-regulators that can help advise on specifics around that in your in your trial protocol. Um, so we, we can help you address that question. Next question on the bottom is, um, how do you address maintenance needs for artificial kidneys? Is a nephrologist or a technician going to be the one who does the routine maintenance? That's a, a really great question. I think obviously is unknown, but I think what's really important is to do primary research with all the relevant um, stakeholders to understand, is this something the nephrologist has bandwidth for, would be able to do the maintenance for this? Or is this something companies that are making these artificial kidneys need to be thinking about of when they're building out their sales force and um, their marketing and, and strategy, how are they going to address those questions? And is technicians or, you know, scientific liaisons going to be needed in order to help with that, that maintenance in, in question. Yeah, I mean, it'll depend on the, on the specific technology. I mean, obviously today, right, with the dialysis equipment, it's not something that NAPS do. There's a whole service ecosystem that the companies have established. I think this is something that we brought up, you know, as we start looking at these new technologies, what's going to be that servicing ecosystem? Um, I don't want to put it on the NAPS, right? You, you want to be able to um, allow the NEFs to, to focus on the clinical, the patient and the clinical care. And, and if there are technology uh, service reps, um, experts that can support, that's going to be key to success because if we, you know, it's always about, about time investment and what can the nephrologist fit into their clinical workflow. And the less we can disrupt that and the more we can actually improve that, the better. How does an early innovator partner with an incumbent company like Medtronic or Frenius? Presenius, sorry. Yeah, you know, what we always advise the early stage companies um, is that you, you obviously want to be able to, um, it's your technology, you know it best, you want to stay in the driver's seat for as long as you can, right? But at the same time, there are going to be points where you need that financial support or that even that strategic support because a lot of these incumbents have uh, the 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 contacts, the networks in the field, the know-how, they brought a lot of technologies through development to the market. Um, so, so we often you know, advise companies in detail on the right kind of path, and it depends on each one, but right, we'll look at kind of the studies and the requirements to get from proof of, you know, from concept to clinical proof of concept to, uh, to market. And along that journey, the more that uh, the early stage company can, can stay in the driver's seat, um, and there's different types of deals that allow for that, different types of financing, partnership models. And, um, and so we typically advise based on what we see that path to market being, some of the inflection points, and, and again, what optimizes kind of the involvement and, um, you know, and value retention for the founding company. An interesting question. Of what are the yeah, on FDA, you know, we will probably we're probably not the regulatory experts. We do have a team at Park Cell um, that people from FDA, uh, you know, specific divisions that are reviewing some of these. They've been advising some of the companies in Zeno already. Um, as we know, there isn't a clear path, and there's still much that FDA needs to start. Um, well, an FDA, of course, will respond as technologies progress too, right? So it's it's hard to get theoreticals from FDA, but um, but that team can advise based on what's you know what their experience in these divisions, also what they've uh, seen companies in the space already interact with FDA and the guidance that they've received. So we would probably bring in those colleagues to answer the regulatory questions. And coming right behind that is that when do we anticipate the first xenotransplant you know, product to be in clinical trials? Hopefully as soon as possible. <laughs> it's hard, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, right? I think there are still some, some challenges to be worked out. I think we've made tremendous progress. I think some of the, um, we've all, you know, we've seen the news on some of the, in, in you know, in human um, 
transplants that have been done, I think that's uh, that's progress. I, we hope within the next five years is, is you know, I don't know in the next year, but in the next five years, we hope this will happen. So you must be likely to pay for a wearable artificial kidney. Uh, yes, there is a structure for ESRD. I think the question though, and this is where, um, again, we, we do a lot of work here, the, the payment models will need to shift, right? We have, there's one structure right now, or two, two or three kind of different structures, right? Based on uh, dialysis, the type of dialysis, and also there's a transplant model and CMS does, does provide reimbursement. As we start engineering these, these novel approaches, including you know, including implantable artificial kidneys, wearable um, artificial kidneys, um, we may have to create a new payment system. Um, and CMS is open to that, but it takes time. Um, and the more that you could fit in under the car reimbursement system or, or create um, parallel types of systems, the better. Uh, whether that's you know, the, the need to service those, um, the wearables. Uh, the need to still come in and be seen by the nephrologist. So it's it's a good question, but it's one that's going to take much, you know, a bit a bit of work. It's going to depend on the technology and the use of the technology. Uh, you know, the team's going to have to look at how it impacts the current system, how it disrupts the system, and then what pieces of the payment infrastructure can be leveraged and what cannot, and where there needs to be, you know, new codes or new systems. But um, but it is possible to broker new codes with CMS. The, the work has to start early. How do companies, early stage companies, take advantage of government support? Yeah, I mean, I think several companies here have, right? I mean, I, I think it's it's great to have EAP. It's great to have NIH support. Um, we absolutely advise that, especially the earliest stages, especially to try to get to a preclinical proof of concept and more you can leverage some of these uh, sources, the better, uh, to they're non -dilutive, dilutive obviously. Um, and they're also a signal, they're also a good stamp of, of you know, recognition uh, and credibility. What do we charge to help us start up? We, uh, we can discuss that with you if you're interested, we hope you are, uh, we, can, we can help, but we're also getting the help of this is the, Reason why we're here, because I think being a prize winner, you get access to resources like us. Uh, so we can work something out. For an early stage artificial kidney developer, who should I go to outside of government and kidney X funding? Are there VCs interested in this space? Yes, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, you can go to both strategics and VCs. Um, there are, you know, Presinius, Medtronic, they have venture arms too. And there you may be able to get um, even more favorable terms, right? For some of the strategic support, uh, there's different models, there's incubator models. So don't rule out strategic um, investors as well. For VCs, um, you know, in the med tech space, sometimes they, they're looking for a bit more data. Um, if you go into early, you know, it, it, you'd have to find the right VC. So I would say to that question. And I would say that one thing health advances has done in the past is help um, early companies, um, even at like the research level, come up with their um, sales pitch to really be able to articulate to VCs and other funding um, ventures to how their technology works and uh, come up with a sales pitch deck that really helps to sell themselves, which um, is something we, we also can help with that we've done in the past. Very important step. Yep. In addition to nephrologists, artificial kidney innovators, collaborative surgeons. Obviously, if it's implantable, yes. Um, if part of the wearable requires uh, any kind of procedure, yes. Um, and I think this just ties to another question around the go-to-market model and uh, the type of technology we'll have, you know, when you think about going to market, different clinicians involved, different patient journeys involved. And so it's important to map that out and thinking about who do you start approaching earlier in, in some of your development work um, as you start thinking about building, um, building out kind of, you know, your, your ecosystem on the marketing side. Okay. I think we kind of quickly powered through those and we also responded in the chat to some of the earlier ones, I believe. So please refer back. 
And this is Mark over at um, with the Kidney X team over at ASN. Uh, we appreciate everybody joining today's uh, presentation. Um, please uh, do reach out to kidneyx at asn-online.org uh, if you want to connect with uh, the Health Advances team. Uh, we really appreciate the Health Advances team doing the research and sharing the research as well as their insights. Um, obviously, got uh, peppered with a lot of questions, and I'm sure there are a lot more. So. Um, we appreciate everybody's both attendance um, and also uh, the Health Advances team for uh, continuing and sharing kind of their insight. All right, thank you. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you.